It's a Mailbag Monday. We've got your questions about Trey Mancini to the Cubs. What does this mean for Matt Mervis? We've got your questions about Brett Beatty and Alex Ramirez for the New York Mets and Jordan Walker for the St. Louis Cardinals. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer and podcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. And today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season more odds, more props, more lines than ever before because Bet Online is where the game starts. Like we do every Monday, we have your questions all about. Uh, your favorite prospects, your favorite teams, minor league baseball as a whole, and all of that. First thing, though, is the Cubs signed Trey Mancini over the weekend to a two-year deal with an opt-out. Now, some of the reporting coming out about this, uh, comments from uh, Jed Hoyer at their fan convention over the weekend, says that the expectation here is Eric Hosmer, as a left-handed hitter, will be playing every day against right-handed pitching. And so the implication there is that Trey Mancini is his platoon partner. But now I'm a little concerned that Matt Mervis may not have everyday playing time for the Chicago Cubs. So when you look at your options you have now, obviously first base can be a platoon of Eric Hosmer and Trey Mancini. Uh, Third base, you're looking at Christopher Morrell or Patrick Wisdom. Uh, One of the two of them, Morrell is also very useful as a utility man, different positions on the field. And then your backups on your bench, you have your backup catcher, Jan Gomes, whoever doesn't win third base between Morrell and Wisdom. You have, as of now, probably Nelson Nelson Velasquez and Zach McKinstry. And unless you deal one of those guys, which you just went out and got, McCash, uh, got McKinstry at the trade deadline, kind of feels like you don't have a roster spot for Matt Mervis. Because Mancini can DH when he's not playing first. You can take Patrick Wisdom and DH him. There's a lot of different options. And so this may work out better if you're not going to have everyday play time for Matt Mervis. It's probably better to start him in AAA. Uh, he needs to play every day. Now, remember, he hit 309 last year between high A, double A, and AAA, but he spent most of that time not in triple a. So I understand the concept of he's not on the 40 man roster. So we're going to start him in triple a. If there's an injury, we have to injured list somebody. Uh, If the team falls apart and we move guys at the deadline, we can call up Matt Mervis. But for right now, we're not going to try to find space on the 40 man roster for him. Instead, we're going to do this. And the 40 man roster, I think is something that a lot of us forget significantly matters when you're looking at prospects who is on the 40 man roster and who is not. If you're not on the 40 man roster, it usually requires possibly losing someone uh, when they get DFA'd to get you onto the 40 man roster. And so because of that teams, unfortunately will consider things like that when they're making these decisions. And that's going to come up later in the show when we talk about Jordan Walker and it doesn't, we're not talking about that working in his favor. Uh, The other interesting transaction that happened recently was shortstop Miguel Rojas being traded from the Marlins to the Dodgers, and the compensation was infielder Jacob Amaya. And so this is a really interesting deal to me for a few different reasons. So first, Jacob Amaya is a very good prospect. He was going to be a top 10 prospect for the Dodgers this year. 2017, 11th rounder out of high school. Uh, His grandfather was actually a Brooklyn Dodgers prospect. So that was kind of a, he's like a legacy big leader, not a thing you see a ton. But uh, last year, 133 games divided between double A Tulsa and triple A Oklahoma City. 261, 369, 427, 17 home runs, 41 extra base hits, 81 walks to 112 strikeouts, and six to eight on stolen bases. So defense first. Fantastic shortstop. No doubt can stick at shortstop. His speed is average, but the 
instincts, his first uh, reaction, his first step is all like elite. Very, very good. The hands are reliable. He can, he, he makes the, the play transfers, makes the throw. The arm is a plus arm. It's accurate. And so like, he's not the flashiest in the world, but he's going to make every play that you need him to make uh, or that he should make. And some of the ones that he really shouldn't have been able to make. So good get as far as giving you a talented, no doubt shortstop for Miami. And only thing that you gave up was a over 30 shortstop that had a questionable power. Now, offensively, there is a little bit, a little bit of question about Jacob Amaya and what his ceiling might be because his power in the past hasn't been great. Now, he did some work, uh, like he, he had been almost elite as far as strike zone discipline. And he did, he tried to hit for a l- more power last year. And you saw 17, uh, was it 17 home runs would have been tops, I believe, for anybody in Miami. Like nobody in Miami's major league roster had 17 home runs. But uh, he does have to sacrifice a little bit of batting average and on base and uh, strikeouts to get that power. And he, he he does better against lefties. Like his, his slash line last year, 320, 423, 541 against lefties. Like 300, 400, 500. He was a dude against lefties. Righties, 240, 349, 387. So there may be something where they, I, there may be something where he has some platoon stuff late in games where they pinch hit for him with some of these other infielders that they have. I do think he is going to start off in AAA though because the uh, the numbers got a little worse when he got to AAA. The walk rate, fourteen and a half percent at AA, fourteen percent AAA. That's fine. The strikeout rate was thirteen point four percent in AA. It was almost twenty four percent in AAA. So I do think they're going to have him go back to AAA to work on some of that. And in the meantime, you're in a really interesting situation in this infield because everything that they have said, like, and by they, I mean Miami's front office and coaching staff, has said that your infield is going to be uh, Gene Segura at third base, Joey Wendell at shortstop, and Jazz Chisholm at second base. And to me, the concept of this is... Dumb. Because if you think about this, Jin Segura has been a shortstop, and most recently he has been playing second base. He has never played third, but you're moving him to third. Joey Wendell, and up front, I love Joey Wendell. I am a fan of Joey Wendell. I genuinely like Joey Wendell. Going back to his time in college, Joey Wendell has never been the starting shortstop on his own team. He went to a Division II school. He was not the starting shortstop. Somebody else was playing short over him. So the concept of you have Jazz Chisholm, we're going to leave him at second. You're going to bring Gene Segura, sign him, make him learn third, and then move Joey Wendell to be the primary everyday shortstop, which is a job he has never done, blows my mind. Because the, the, the common sense to me is you move Jazz Chisholm to shortstop, you let Gene Segura play second, like he's been doing, and you have Joey Wendell and or John Birdie at third. But I think when you think about this, the expectation for Miami is that Jacob Amaya doesn't take all season to get ready to come to the bigs. And so if you set this up with Segura at third, Jazz at second, and Wendell at short, Wendell's on an expiring deal, and... There's less moving parts when you put Wendell in or when you put Amaya into place at shortstop. All you're doing is you're switching out one thing. Whereas if you have Jazz at short and you have Segura at second and you have Wendell at third, then when you bring up Amaya, you're moving Jazz either out to third to replace Wendell or into second. And then you're having to flop everybody during the season. So I get it. I'm not saying I like it. I think Jess Chisholm could be an above average to plus shortstop as well as being the drip king and having a 2020 season. Like I think that's like Jess Chisholm can entirely do that. So I don't love the concept, but I understand why they would do it in just a minute. I've got some Mets questions. uh, You know, now since Carlos Correa is not going to be there, 
But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at BetOnline. BetOnline BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional amateur league out there. Pro football, we just saw a great weekend of football. Last game is tonight, Monday night. Uh, Basketball, NBA, college, they're all going on right now. They've got everything at BetOnline.net. It's the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action because BetOnline is where the game starts. Okay, reminder, if you have questions for the Locked on MLB Prospects mailbag, you can go to our new Discord. Link is in the episode description. Link is in the show notes. All of these questions came from listeners in the Discord. First one is from Bobby Ballantyne. So, you know, it's a play on Bobby Ballantyne. And he asked about Brett Beatty. Brett Beatty was 19 when he was drafted, which is like he turned 20 in November of that year. And that's something kind of turned a lot of teams off. But... He's done really well, and he is on track to be a cont- a contending for the starting third base job in spring training. I still think Escobar is the starting third baseman, but Brett Beatty is there. They called him up a little bit last year. He got some time, hit a home run. Uh, and so does him doing better alleviate the concerns MLB teams have about the older prep prospects? Brett Beatty, last year, he got 89 games in AA and six games in AAA before getting called up. Those 89 games, 312, 406, 544, 19 home runs, 41 extra base hits. So he hit the 300, 400, 500 thing and then had almost an extra base hit every other game. 46 walks to 98 strikeouts and two of five on stolen bases. I think the answer to this is... It depends on why they didn't like the fact that he turned 20 the year he got drafted. It's it's not so much the development of the play. I do think that him working out showed that, hey, for the most part, if a guy's good enough to get drafted in the first round, they're probably going to be good enough to still debut at a young age. In this case, he debuted at 22, despite the fact that he's older than a traditional player when you drafted him. And when you look at Brett Beatty, he's going to be a very good player. His speed's not great, mind you. It's He's got 45 speed. But despite that, uh, he's got a plus arm and you know kind of gives average to above average defense at third, depending on the range. And then offensively, I mean, he is a plus hitter, above average power. He's going to be like a middle of the lineup uh, power hitter who's going to give you 20-something home runs a, a year. Uh, hits less than 50% ground balls. His average exit velo is like 92 miles an hour. His 90th percentile is 107. He doesn't chase a ton. Uh, When he does swing, he makes contact and he makes quality contact. He walks. The on base should be good. All of that's fine. But I think the reason you're still going to see some teams hesitate about the older prep prospects is the Rule 5 draft. So the difference between four years of control before you have to make the Rule 5 decision, and five years of control before you have to make the decision, is how old are they when you sign them? Are they 18 or are they 19? Or are they 18 and younger? International free agents, things like that. Are they 18 or younger, or are they 19 or older? And so, fundamentally, drafting a 19-year-old prepster is trading one year of team control without having to make a 40-man decision for somebody who still needs probably the same time frame as a prep player to develop. And there's some teams that just aren't going to make that trade-off or they're going to weigh and require the player to be more advanced than your typical prep draftee before they'll make that trade-off. Uh, the Guardians strike me as an organization that would not be willing to make that trade-off unless it was somebody who was immensely talented and they were somehow picking in like the top five. And so I don't think you're ever going to see teams just not care about that. You may have less teams worried about it, but I still think from what I understand, most of the concern about that was the team control. If he took a little longer to develop, which sometimes happens to prep players, we have to make a 40 man decision on him a year earlier and he may not be ready for the bigs and or we may not know enough information to, to know whether he's going to work out or not, but we have to go ahead and make the 40-man decision now. So I think that's a big part of it that we don't necessarily think about. Uh, 
I do agree he's done really well. And for the most part, he's shown that 18 or 19 doesn't really matter as far as development, but it does matter, unfortunately, for the Rule 5. Another question, Jeremy, while we're on this system, uh, Jeremy asked about Alex Ramirez. Had a good season last year in the minors, and so what's the next steps here? So 2019 IFA was Alex Ramirez, 121 games between uh, low A St. Lucie and high A Brooklyn. 281, 346, 436, 11 home runs, 48 extra base hits, 44 walks to 122 strikeouts, and 21 to 37 on stolen bases. And what I think here to, to, to remember about Alex Ramirez is, one, he is incredibly athletic. He is probably the best athlete in this system. The raw tools are very, very good. Now, he's also pretty raw, right? So he signed in in 2019. He didn't get a minor league season in 2020. And so he didn't come stateside until June 2021, which was like two years after he signed. So uh, a couple things to work on, but let's talk about what he does well. Defensively, he's above average runner, but he's one of those defenders that just like effortlessly covers ground, right? So he can give you plus defense because he covers ground so well. The arm is plus if he ends up physically not being able to stick in center. He's 6'3", 170 right now. You have to assume, you know, some physical development. He was only eight, he was only 19 years old last year. Some routine physical development could put him too big to stick in center. The arm works and profiles in right field. So you're fine there. Offensively, got a couple things to work on, but... Uh, what he does well. So the, his swing, it's very smooth swing. He's He's gotten rid of some of the extraneous stuff in his swing. He had a bunch of extra stuff in there, like a big load into the swing, uh, a bat wrap, stuff like that. He's, he's eliminated some of that, but the swing is still a fluid swing, very good bat speed with it. And then the things that he's been working on at the plate, he was working last year on getting deeper counts, waiting to get the right pitch to hit. So it's like, I can hit this, but I can do damage to that. So let me wait on that better pitch. And so I think what he needs to work on this year is chasing less, which is just something you hear about any 19-year-old baseball player, chasing less, uh, swinging less often. And that goes back to uh, hunting his pitch versus a pitch and then uh, developing that power a little more. And I think that's going to be a physical development thing. I will say scouts that I've talked to and people that I've discussed him with have pointed out that when you watch him in person, he very much, and I'm not going through the motions, but he's very casual about it. And he doesn't always have the sense of urgency. I think the words that were said to me uh, was, it's like he's on cruise control. And so there is a little bit of that mental aspect that I could see a 19-year-old who's on his 100th game of the year getting a little bit, uh, thinking it's a little bit monotonous. And so finding ways to continuously challenge him and keep him engaged is something that they're going to have to work on going forward. Part of that's him as well. He has stuff to do. It's not just a team thing, but understanding that that's something to work on is an important thing. In just a minute, I've got a question about Jordan Walker as well as an update on minor league unionization. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories, you've got to try a Built Bar. I've discussed this on the show before, but I'm trying to eat healthier. I'm trying to do better. And so Built Bars have been great because they're healthy, but they're tasty. 100% real chocolate, and they're like 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 17 grams of protein. So very good for you. And what I love now is I don't have to go to built.com and wait for a package in the mail. If I realize that I'm running low, I can head to the store. I can go to Walmart, walk to the pharmacy section and get a four bar box of cookies and cream of double chocolate or of coconut puff. If I'm close to Sam's, I can run into Sam's and get a 13 bar box of brownie batter or churro. So it's good for you. It's easy to get because just about every county in the country, it feels like, has a Walmart and or Sam's. 
And so there's no reason not to eat built bars and put that into part of your day in 2023 as you're trying to live your best life and take care of your body. So go to built.com, check out all of the flavors, the churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, all that stuff, or go to Walmart for cookies and cream, double chocolate or coconut puff, or go to Sam's Club for brownie batter and churro. You can thank me later. Okay, so Jim in our Discord, uh, he asks, who is traded to make room on the roster for Jordan Walker? And this is going to be a little bit of a tough, something. it's going to be tough to figure out for St. Louis because here's your scenario you have right now is you're starting three outfielders right now is you have Tyler O'Neill, you have Lars Newtbar, and you have Dylan Carlson. So you have three starting out starting outfielders. You traded Harrison Bader during the season because you felt good about your starting three. Now Dylan Carlson, I think, broke a finger after that. So slumped a little bit, but you you have those three. And Jordan Walker is going to be a very, very good MLB hitter. I want him to be out there on opening day. Uh, and just a reminder, 2021st rounder out of high school. He's a humongous human being, 6'5, 230. I tweeted the picture of him on Saturday. He was at one of the Meet the Fan things, and he was bigger than anybody else in the room. Uh, but 119 games in Double A last year after they they moved him to the outfield. 306, 388, 510, 19 home runs, 53 extra base hits, 58 walks to 116 strikeouts, and 22 of 27 on stolen bases. Uh, defensively, plus arm. He was a third baseman. Speeds above average. It's ideal right field profile in a pinch he could play center field he did a little bit of it in the minors and in the cfl uh, cfl in the afl it's not the canadian football league in the arizona fall league he did a little bit of center field uh, and then offensively six five he's got the long levers but really really good contact ability and so he's able to make solid enough contact where you don't necessarily have to worry about uh the levers being an issue 45% of his balls in play were greater than 95 miles an hour. And the max exit below he hit a ball was 114.6, which is the 99th percentile of it for minor leaguers 21 or under. Offensively, I think he's just about ready. But the issue, he, okay, he, here's the issue. You have Carlson, O'Neill, and Newt Barr. The 40-man roster has a couple other outfielders None of them are Jordan Walker. Alec Burleson is on the 40-man roster. He's projected to be a bench piece right now. Moises Gomez, who we've talked about, has a ton of power, but a questionable hit tool. And remember, your power tool is only as good as your hit tool. Uh, he's also on the 40-man roster. And so the way that it sets right now is it takes probably one or two injuries and or guys being moved to find room for Jordan Walker unless you make a deliberate decision to find room for Jordan Walker. I mean, he's an elite prospect. You should make a deliberate decision to find room for him. But as it stands right now, you have to move one of those three outfielders and then, you know, and so in the clear up a 40 man spot to get Jordan Walker. Now, if it's me, I've seen a, I've had, I've seen a lot of stuff about, Dylan Carlson being asked for in trade talks. I do think there is a deal that could be made with Miami. They are still looking for a center fielder. I think you could point to when he was healthy and his performance when he was healthy, and you could do some sort of deal where you sold Dylan Carlson for Pablo Lopez, get you a pitcher. Uh, but you do have to make an intentional decision to clear a 40-man roster spot to get a starter for Jordan Walker. I don't know exactly which guy it would be. I know there's been questions. There's been requests for Carlson in trade talks. There's been requests for O'Neill in trade talks. I don't know if anybody's asked for Lars Newtbar, but either way, I think that you're going to have to see one of those three guys get moved to deliberately create a spot for Jordan Walker understanding that you still have Alec Burleson available to fill in if someone gets hurt. And again, you have a Moises Gomez who could be called up. Uh, he's not a great def uh, defender, but he's somebody else who could be called up 
uh, to take an outfield spot if injuries were to happen after you made the move. But I still think you have to deliberately decide to make a move to free a spot for Jordan Walker. Clev in our Discord asked about, should we be expecting another cut of an entire level of the minors? Remember in 2020, they restructured the minors, got rid of some levels, reduced it to 120 affiliates, four for each organization. There's a couple reasons why I don't think we necessarily have to worry about that right now. Uh, Number one is you have the player development license, that PDL that was signed after the 2020 reorganization. That in, In essence, that's the agreement between the major league organization and the minor league affiliate that you are an affiliate of ours. We provide your players. Here's what we pay for. Here's what you pay for and all of that. It's a 10 year deal. So it runs until 2030. Now, as I understand, under that deal, the MLB team is obligated to provide players to that minor league team for them to have a season. So unless you negotiate to uh, buy them out of that contract or somehow terminate that contract, you are locked into that until 2030. Now, if they don't meet the requirements of upgrading the parks or some of the different things that have been put forward, they could lose that early. But for the most part, if they stick with what they're supposed to do, they have an affiliation until 2030. So that's one reason why I'm hesitant to think we'll see a reorganization in the next few years. The other reason is you have the reserve list. Uh, The list of players who are under control by each minor league organization, uh, that is something in the CBA negotiations, MLB asked, the Players Association, they wanted control over the size of the list. And the Players Association said no. And so the Players Association still has still has the list. MLB cannot lower the size of that list and by consequence, lower the number of players that each minor league organization can have or that their, that their minor leagues can have. MLB cannot change that figure without negotiating that with the Players Association. Now, I don't know, we're not privy as to the minor league CBA. I don't know if the ability to unilaterally change the number of players in minor league baseball, I'm pretty willing to guarantee is not going to be something that the minor league CBA gives to MLB. And so any change in the size of the list which is, again, how many players each organization is allowed to have in its affiliated minor leagues, any change to the size of that list has to be collectively bargained. The whole reason that MLB cut minor league affiliates last time was they were raising pay. And so the financial outlay was just about the same. They cut a level, but they gave everybody pay raises. So their dollar figures didn't change any. I think until we get a CBA and we know how much more financially the minor leagues are going to cost the uh, the owners, that'll be when we find out how aggressive do they want to be about the next time they have the ability to go in and make the change. I don't know if they're going to be that aggressive about changing it, but again, we'll find out once we know how much more per organization Are they paying in salaries and benefits and things like that? How do they look to recoup those costs? Fantastic week this week. We're previewing the National League East. So starting with the Braves on Tuesday, the Mets, then the Phillies, Miami, and the Washington Nationals. Reminder, if you have questions for the show, I'm on Twitter at Crossy Baseball. Show's on Twitter at Locked On Farm. Or you can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com. Until tomorrow's show, this has been Locked On MLB Prospects. 